Good morning, everybody. It started getting quiet, so that's the cue. Um, we're here to worship together, so let's stand up for this first song. It's kind of an old one. We haven't done it in a while, but I'm sure like everybody knows it. So, anyway. Jeremy's got some stuff to play the beat. Nope. We got in at uh, two o'clock this morning. Um, you know, this is the first time ever being on a mission trip with my sister. First time she's ever flown out of the country. First time she's ever been on a plane. First time Brandon's ever been on a mission trip. And uh, my sister says she's got a younger brother now. And Brandon told her on the way back on the airplane that uh, she's got middle uh, sibling syndrome now. So, uh, 
but we had a phenomenal time. I'm going to go through some pictures here. So this is the compound that we stayed at um, right at the base of the mountains. Um, so it's the Caribbean Colorado is what they call it. Um, it's like 10,174 feet elevation. Um, you know, so as you can see, um, it was about a two hour ride to the airport, give or take traffic. Uh, every time you'd go uphill, you know, you'd have to turn off air condition. Um, was this Patrick? That's Patrick. Patrick. So this is the first guy we went to on Monday. We went out ministering, uh, preaching God's word and praying with people and seeing their needs. Um, and it was a great time. Uh, you know, he was in Haiti, um, been living in the Dominican. His wife died. He's raised three kids. And uh, his main prayer that he wanted, besides work, um, was for uh, peace in his country so he could go back home. Um, this is where we went to church at on Sunday morning um, to a Haitian community church. And it was about an hour, 20 minutes or so away from uh, where we were staying at. Um, this here, we had BBS every afternoon on all, the people that done evangelism. Uh, we had 130 plus kids every day uh, that was in the community. A lot of them was going to the, the church there. Um, we played games, had crafts, uh, sang songs, uh, taught them stuff in Creole, taught them stuff in Spanish. Um, and, and Brandon really fit right in with the kids. He just, he just ate it up. Um, so this right here, um, so we was out ministering every single day. Uh, we come across a woman uh, right in that little gate there um, where we, we got to go in, we spoke to her, and she was a Christian but wasn't going to church. Um, but she went and grabbed her friend, uh, and her friend, uh, I'll get to that when we get to the picture, but so the woman that has the towel thing wrapped on her head and that uh, second slideshow right there, um, it was her testimony, not really her testimony, but her story was very powerful and very true. Um, the thing that floored me away um, by her is we started talking to her, and uh, she we asked her if uh, she knew Jesus, and she said, no, I don't want to go to church, don't want to know God. Um, and as we was talking, the young couple, Elle and uh, Lance, um, they're youth, uh, he's a youth pastor out in uh, New Mexico, and uh, Brother Rob used them uh, very graciously. She was talking about she lived with her boyfriend. And she was so honest that she said she did not want to know Jesus because she loved the pleasures of the world. I mean, that's her exact words, that's what she said. Um, there's very few people that's that honest when you're talking to them that says that they love the pleasures of the world and that's why they don't want to know Jesus. Um, and so between uh, Lance and Elle talking to her, uh, Brother Rob and myself and others um, telling stories and praying with her, um, she decided that she wanted to know Jesus after talking about heaven and hell and relationships and, and sin and um, all that. And uh, as she was praying, she was sitting in a plastic chair and her knees hit the ground. And, uh, you know, it was just amazing to see somebody to start talking to her, you know, and uh, accept the Lord um, on this trip. Um, we had so many different conversations with different people. Um, the other picture there on the side that um, is a Dominican family. And uh, she let us in and I was like, oh, great. You know, I seen the, the Lord's Supper hanging up on there. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get to use my Catholic background on this one. And uh, then she started talking about her, her uh, brother's a, a pastor in New Jersey or New York or something like that. And she said she knew Jesus, so I didn't get to use all my, my Catholic stuff on her. But um, <laughs> we had a great time talking, and um, I got to pray uh, with her and her family and uh, her situation. And you know, This here is just some of the pictures of the VBS. We've done it, like I said, every afternoon for four days. Um, and... You know, we as worshiping, singing, playing with the kids. Um, that's our whole group right there standing in the chapel um, that went out every day. Uh, this here is on the compound. Uh, that's Brother Rob and Pastor Wally. And uh, we may be uh, in the future, um, just kicking it around, but he's from the Appalachian side, not far from where Allison grew up. Um, and uh, he's in Maryland, and uh, there's a doctor that's... Uh, there in West Virginia, I'll maybe go work with some Appalachian people and maybe do some ministry work there with them. Um, but Mission of Hope had this big cube for everybody to take pictures on, you know, so we all uh, done that. 
Brother Rob actually was relaxing for a little while laying in the hammock, so I thought I'd get a picture of that. He didn't do that too often, but uh, Rob hasn't seen these pictures. Me and Branham picked them out last night. So we hiked up the mountains and went to the waterfall. And uh, so uh, everybody thought I was gonna be standing at the top of that waterfall uh, like Lion King or something. Cause I, everybody else was hiking down the bottom of the waterfall and I, I, you know, I took the oddball trail and went by myself up to the mountain top and uh, found out it was actually a locking dam up there and then everybody else went up there. But, um, me and my sister and Rob by the waterfall, you know, hiking up to it. Um, so this guy here, I, I thought it was kind of funny we found this car. We just, I didn't get a picture of this guy that uh, we prayed with. Um, but on the car right next to him, it had God first on there. Don't know if it actually means that or not, but I seen that on the hood of the car and thought it was great. But so this guy right here, he's walking down this neighborhood, and uh, it was more of a a gang-related neighborhood just by the atmosphere that we was in and the people. We actually had some guy that was trying to run us off. Um, I don't know if he was the gang leader, or like the watchdog for the area or whatever. But I mean, we was all safe. Uh, never felt unsafe one bit. But this guy right here, um, Brother Rob kind of called him over. Jefferson was our interpreter, and he was, he was a great guy. I actually got his phone number and we talked a little bit. But um, So this guy right here, um, I can't remember if his mom or his dad left him and came to the States to New Jersey. And uh, he's around six or eight years old or around there. His other parent left him, and he grew up on the street um, all by himself and uh, became a drug dealer. And... Uh, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get to use my background on this too. You know, we had a lot of history there, you know. Some of you guys know my testimony in, in that area. And uh, we had great conversations, but it come to find out that uh, he's actually been preaching the gospel and he's changed his life from uh, the stuff on the street. Ain't saying he's 100% changed because we all have sin in our life, but uh, he said he's, he, you know, for the environment that he's in, that he's, you know, doing the best he can to follow the Lord and everything. And he said he did have struggles with uh, you know, his history and past and just trying to live in that community. Um, that's us with a woman, that woman right there in the red uh, uh, top there. She's actually a nurse looking for work. Um, we was able to talk to her. And, uh, this, this little girl right here just blew me away. I mean, she's eight or 10 years old and she brought this notebook and she finally got some crayons and some color pencils. and. Um, She's amazing, amazing artist. I mean, she had a notebook there and had one whole picture full of eyes, different type of eyes and hands and all kinds of stuff. But the amazing part about this picture is that girl that's in there, she actually colored her as a white person. Uh, that was really interesting to me, you know, uh, to see uh, that. And you can see her there, she's drawing a cheerleader. She drew a cheerleader and she was coloring it. Uh, Brandon there, he. Like I said, he just ate it up, playing with them kids and loving on them and, and coloring with them and right down in there. Uh, we had uh, Polly here. Uh, she, she dressed up in different outfits. She was the sun. She was the earth. She was the chicken. She rode in on a chicken. And the kids just didn't know what to think. We actually hung up the whole solar system across the church. It took us hours to blow up the solar system. <laughs> Brain about passed out a few times, I think. But, uh, you know... There's some of the different, the, so uh, that picture right there, the clothesline, uh, I was praying with this young woman and uh, Brother Rob was over here uh, talking to a, a Dominican and uh, we got done praying with that woman and uh, I mean their houses are eight to 10 feet apart. I mean, they're small. Um, I was like, we're gonna go catch up Brother Rob. And uh, so we went in there and this woman here was hooping and hollering and I, I couldn't understand what she was saying. I asked the interpreter, I said, what's wrong with her? And, uh, she, he, he said that she's saying that she's actually mad because we didn't stop and pray with her or spend time with her. And uh, I said, we'll be right back. So we went back and uh, she was still kind of bent up that, you know, us Americans would come there and walk right by her, you know, but she was busy hanging clothes on the line. So uh, I was serious with but joking at the same time. I said, uh, you know, we'll finish hanging your laundry for you. And she was sure enough to hand me a pair of shorts. And, and uh, so we all took turns uh, hanging laundry all the way across the line and, and done all that. And that broke the ice and, and give us the opportunity to uh, share the gospel with her and pray with her. And um, the amazing thing about it, and there's no picture of this, um, 
Rob and a young girl named Karen that's in that picture in the orange shirt. So God works in a lot of mysterious ways and set up divine appointments in a lot of different ways. And I don't know if we'll make it all through this uh, time. But, um, yeah. But uh, so as we was going down the street praying for different people, Brandon got to pray for a young boy that, um, that about three or four years old that hasn't spoken, uh, lives on top of this uh, house with steep stairs like this that ain't that wide. And she said that this boy fell down that stairs multiple times. And uh, So we, we prayed for the woman and Brandon prayed for the boy. And we had another boy that, you know, had, uh, what, Brandon knows the exact terms, but, you know, lack of oxygen and um, she was having trouble raising him. We prayed with him, but so as we went past this woman and Rob was over here and I was over here praying and uh, we went back and spent time with this woman hung laundry and uh, if we wouldn't have went back and hung that laundry it's very possible that we wouldn't have missed our last stop of that day because we probably would have been past it but as we got done with this woman and we went down the road these people came out in the street and drug us in the house and uh, their loved one was dying on the bed and uh Rob and Karen was in there, and Karen was uh, helping her uh, stay rest, and Rob was praying with her, and me and the interpreter was right there, and we was praying in the room, and I got, me and the interpreter went in after Rob and Karen did, but, you know, here we was, going down this road, praying with people. Um, whether whether it was because we stopped and, and uh, hung on or not, but uh, divine intervention was, you know, we was drug in the house and was able to pray for this family. As, as their loved one was dying on her bed. There's some of the different people. That was the, that was the Dominican uh, brother. I was a brother up there, he was a baseball player. He kept calling him, you know, that he was talking to him, walked by, and just some different, you know, groups of people he was praying with. There, brother Rob, I sent Allison this. One morning we was going uh, to our, our place, and the air conditioning works really good in the morning. It works pretty good in the afternoon. But, um, Brother Robbie got cold and he was using the curtains on the thing there to cover up and stay, try to stay warm. I thought that was great. But that's it. So just want to let you know we appreciate you guys praying for us. Um, if you want to know more about what we experienced, uh, you're more welcome to talk to us. Um, but thank you guys for supporting us and praying for us. And We had a phenomenal trip. Um, you know, I'm going to tell one story on Brandon. That uh, just blew me away. I mean, he was great to work with. We, I got to know him a lot better. You know, I consider him as, as a true brother instead of just a brother in Christ. He's a real brother. But the thing that uh, really touched me and touched my heart, we was on the plane in Miami, had almost a six-hour layover. And uh, we got on the plane, and, uh, you know, Brandon, he likes to talk to a lot of people. Come, come to find out, one of my old customers, uh, I met in Miami, which is actually uh, Kyle Halfacre's uh, father and mother-in-law in Miami, and they rode on the plane and sit next to me. But Brandon got on the plane, sat right next to this young couple about his age, and they were talking about their, their vacation, all their money and the things that they'd done. And I heard him sharing about praying for people and talking about our mission trip to strangers on the plane. And that is made me feel really good. So I just want to thank you guys. Appreciate it. Love you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darkness seems to hide 
his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the grave On Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand what you are, unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent any mortal man you are not a god in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is you are not a god created by human hands you are not a god dependent on any mortal man you are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. You are God alone. And right now. Good times and bad You are on your throne You are God alone You're the only God whose power None can contend You're the only God whose name and praise will never end You're the only God who's worthy of everything we can get You are God And that's just the way it is You are God alone From before time began You were on your throne You are God alone And right now In the good times and bad Stop. 
alone from before time began you were on your throne you are god alone and right now in the good times and bad you are on your throne you are god alone unchangeable unshakable unstoppable that's what you are well our ushers please come and take offering at this time My son, I haven't seen him in a while. I've been out of the country. <laughs> hey, the greatest message you'll ever hear, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. It's preached by Jesus, the King, about his kingdom and what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom, how to be in this world, but not of this world. And it begins, as we've seen in past weeks, with kingdom attitudes, Matthew 5, 1 through 12, or sometimes called the Beatitudes. And so how we think as kingdom people, as kingdom of heaven people in the kingdoms of this world, how we think is where it begins. Uh, these attitudes, sometimes called the Beatitudes, and Beatitude is Latin for blessed. So these attitudes are attitudes of blessings. We're blessed by God, and we're called to be people of blessing and to bless others because of the blessings we've received. In Matthew 5, 9 through 12 this morning, we're going to put these final two Beatitudes together like two sides of the same coin. So I'm going to be reading verse 9 through 12. Matthew 5, 9 through 12. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. And ladies, don't be disturbed there. It means daughters of God too. It doesn't just mean 
a gender thing. It has to do with sonship, daughtership. It has to do with being children of the king and all the rights that come down through that bloodline. That's the idea there. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the heirs, the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you see, blessed are the peacemakers there in verse 9, and blessed are those who are persecuted. Notice in verse 10, for righteousness' sake, but then he emphasizes in verse 11, for my sake. Those are the same thing said in different ways. So blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be the sons of God. Blessed are the persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, in this world, being a peacemaker often means being persecuted in some way or some fashion. It is as we seek to make peace with others, sometimes we're not treated with much respect and the ultimate end of that is persecution. Peacemaking and persecution sometimes go together in a strange way. I'm reminded of the great story of Suge Jordan. He was the uh, legendary football coach for Auburn University. In fact, the stadium's named after him down there on the plains of Alabama. And Suge Jordan back in the day was recruiting in the home of a young guy. They wanted to come to Auburn, and he said, now, son, let me tell you what kind of ball players we want for the Auburn Tigers. He said, there's, there's a guy that knocks a kid down, and the kid stays down. We don't want a player like that. The boy said, okay. He said, then there's a guy that knocks a player down, and he gets up, and he knocks him down again, and he stays down. We don't want a player like that. He said, okay. He said, then there's a player, you knock him down, and he gets up, and you knock him down, and he gets up, and you knock him down, and he gets up, and then he finally stays down. We don't want a player like that. And the boy was kind of confused. He said, well, what kind of player do you want, coach? He said, we want that guy that keeps knocking everybody down. <laughs> and it's like that in this world. There's some people who just keep knocking people down and keeping people down. And the idea of being a peacemaker has within it the idea that there are people out here that are trying to knock us down. And yet, we're called to be kingdom citizens Peacemaker. So what is a peacemaker there in verse uh, 9? Well, a peacemaker is a person that has the three pieces of peace. There are three pieces of peace that make us peacemakers. Write these down. First, there's peace with God. Hold your finger there and turn over to the book of Romans real quick. Romans chapter 5. Now, you've had more sleep than I have, so come on. Let's go. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Peace with God. Now I'm reading from the New King James Version. If you have an Old King James, it'll be a little bit different slant on this verb, but that's all right. We'll talk about it. Romans 5, 1. Paul says, therefore, having been. If you've got Old King James, it'll say being, but it's past tense. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? through our Lord Jesus Christ. So being a peacemaker begins with having this peace that comes through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins. We were at enmity with God, the Bible says. We were enemies of God. But even Paul will say in another verse in Romans 5, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. He gave his life for us to bring us to reconcile Two parties together who were at enmity with each other. God loves us, but he doesn't love our sin. And our sin separates us from God. So Jesus came to make peace. What do we call him? The Prince of Peace. Because he came preaching peace to sinners like us and then dying on the cross so that we'd stop being at war with God and with each other. And we'd be peaceable. So Romans 5.1, there's the peace of 
with God. That comes when you trust Jesus as your Savior. When you're born again, you're at peace with God. You become part of the family. So he says there in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. That is, we're at peace with God. Secondly, there's the peace of God. The peace of God. In Roman, uh, excuse me, in, in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Notice it doesn't say the peacekeepers, but the peace. Maker. So just what is peace? Well, the Greek word for peace is the word we get the feminine name Irene from. It's Irene. And it means to bind together. In the Greek language, in the Bible's viewpoint, peace is when all your loose ends get knotted together, get threaded together, get wound up together. And there is a sense when we come to Christ and we're forgiven. And we begin living with Christ, things that stir us up, things that uh, make us anxious, things that bother us, things that stress us out. As we walk with him in fellowship and love, he begins to tie those things together, bind those, all those loose ends that dangle. He begins to put all that together. Irene. And I begin to have this peace. I have peace with God. And now I begin to walk it out. I begin to have the peace of God. My marriage begins to be more peaceable, and my home begins to be more peaceable, and my approach to life begins to be more peaceable because he's putting those loose ends together. All those things I tried to make fit that wouldn't fit, that wouldn't fit, that wouldn't fit, and gave me a fit. (laughs) He puts that all together. That's the peace of God. You have to have peace with God before you can have the peace of God. Then you're a peacemaker. See, peacekeepers don't get persecuted. Peacekeepers just go along to get along. But peacemakers are living for Jesus. And the devil doesn't like that one little bit. And some people don't either. That's the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. And a lot of times in our Christian experience, instead of being a peacemaker, trying to go tell people about Jesus, show them the love of God, show them what peace is all about, we become peacekeepers. We just sort of tolerate people, go along to get them. That's not what God's called us to do. And the reason we sort of back off is because we don't want conflict. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be called a name. We don't want to be singled out. We want to blend in, but that's not what God's done. He's called us to be in his kingdom and to preach the message of peace. And a world that is at war with God doesn't like it one little bit. And so he says, the peace with God, the peace of God. Now turn to Philippians chapter 4. I'm coming back to Matthew in just a minute. Philippians chapter 4, the third piece of peace, number one, peace with God, that comes through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Peace of God, that comes as we walk with him faithfully, consistently. He begins to tie all our loose ends together and bind it together and make us peaceable people. And then there's this peace that passes understanding. There's this peace, Philippians 4. I'm going to begin reading along about verse 6. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. Passes understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. There is a peace that surpasses our understanding. There is a peace that doesn't make sense to the world. There is a peace that sometimes doesn't even make sense to us. And I know when my first wife was dying of cancer, I had a peace. People would say, how do you do it? How do you drain a liter and a half of fluid off her lung every day? How do you get her out of bed and into bed? How do you get her into the shower and out of the shower? How do you get her into the bathroom, out of the bathroom? How do you feed her and take care of her? There's a peace. It wasn't easy. I wouldn't want to do it again. I didn't get any angel's wings for doing it. I don't wear a halo. (laughs) My head shines a lot anymore, (laughs) but I don't wear a halo. But there was this peace. And you've experienced it too at times. And people will look at you when all hell's breaking loose in your life or when the struggle is intense. 
It doesn't make sense, and yet you have this sense that God is with you. There's a peace that passes understanding. And he does that because if we could understand it, it wouldn't be from him. But he comes and he gives us that peace. So would you say you've got the three pieces of peace this morning? That's how you be a peacemaker. Peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace of God by living for Jesus Christ. And that peace that passes understanding. Yeah, your life's not perfect and neither is mine. <laughs> Let's fess up this morning. We have nothing to fear. And yet, I have a peace that I can't understand in the midst of my life. So those three qualities, those three pieces of peace makes us peacemakers. Verse 9 of chapter 5, going back there to Matthew. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be the sons, the daughters of God. Kingdom people had the prince of peace ruling and reigning in their hearts. And they take that peace, or they're supposed to, to a world of people who sometimes don't want it. And that's where the persecution comes from there in verse 10. Sometimes as we're preaching Jesus, trying to love people, trying to reach out and share, we get attacked. We get uh, accosted. We get persecuted to one degree or another. And you may have had an experience like this. I have, won't go into great detail about it, but you, you, you find an animal in a trap or a wounded animal or something, you want to help it, and yet that animal tries to bite your finger off, you know, scratch your eyes out, claw your ears off. And if you could just talk animal, let's say it's a coon, let's say it's a dog, let's say it's a whatever. If you could just talk their language, say, hey, I'm trying to help you, but they don't get it. They think you're trying to hurt them. And the only way for you to help them is for them to hurt you. And that's hard when you put it into people terms. A lot of us rather help animals than people. <laughs> you know, the more I know about people, the more I like my dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and yet God didn't call us to preach peace to dogs, but to people who sometimes lash out when all we're trying to do is get them out of the trap trying to help their wound. And that's what he's talking about here. Blessed are the peacemakers as they go to make peace. There's a blessing for those who are persecuted. Most of us who have tried to preach Jesus, tried to live Jesus, tried to do Jesus, haven't done it for very long before somebody called us a name or did something, and we felt that. And so being a peacemaker who is often persecuted for, verse 10, righteousness sake, verse 11, his name's sake, means that you live for Jesus in such a way that you experience the devil's opposition to some degree. Now, persecution, verse 10, is a very strong word. We were in the Dominican Republic this week because we can no longer go to Haiti. And we've talked about that in the past, a long-standing relationship we've had with ministry in Haiti. But Haitians are persecuted. We are not in this word sense. So it's much different to be a Christian in Haiti than it is to be a Christian in the United States of America. Let's make that clear. But there is some degree of persecution or ostracism that we experience in the United States of America, and it is incrementally increasing in various ways. Will we be on earth long enough to see persecution in America like they do in Haiti and other places? I'm thinking of Indonesia and some places in India. I, I don't know. I don't know. But every Christian in every country in every culture who seeks to be a person of peace is at some point in their pilgrimage, in their process, going to face some form of opposition because Satan 
absolutely detests a person that goes out and lives for Jesus. And so we can't really factor in, in American terms, what it means to be persecuted unless we've been there and seen it. I've been there and seen it. Some of you have too. And I think a few months ago, I showed a picture of a Haitian pastor whom I had the great joy of helping learn in a pastor's conference. I'd signed his certificate. And yet, just a few months ago, he was beheaded in front of his family. That's persecution. That's what we normally think about. We, 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 can't, we can't comprehend that. Uh, we, we Americans can't comprehend that. I can't recreate that for you this morning. What some Christian people are experiencing every single day. That's how they live. That's how it is. We don't have that. <laughs> We're blessed in many, many, many ways. But there is a sense, even in America, of opposition to the gospel message. And here's the point of this passage as we come to the table this morning. Um, as we commit to be peacemakers, we go for Jesus, telling people about the peace of Christ. Now, he died on the cross for our sins to bring us to God. So we lay down our arms, stop fighting God, stop fighting one another, and be at peace Peace with God, peace of God, peace that passes understanding. As we do that, we will also experience some sort of persecution to some degree. And as those two, two sides of the same coin, peacemakers and persecution, as those two come together, we experience blessings in disguise. We experience what Jesus experienced when he was on this earth. Think about it. He did nothing but good. Nothing but good. He was perfect. Loving. Gracious. Kind. Forgiving. Merciful. All that. And yet, what did he face? And so as we choose to walk with him, we experience all the blessings, but also some blessings in disguise. We will be misunderstood. So was he. We will be criticized. So was he. We will be ridiculed. So was he. We will be called names. Believe me, I've been called some. So was he. We'll be rejected. Can I say something? I hate to be rejected. But so was he. We'll be forsaken. Not by him. But so was he. We'll be betrayed. So was he. And we will be denied many of this world's pleasures and treasures, as Jeremy testified about Dorothy. Her name was Dorothy, the lady on the picture. And I told her after she fell to her knees and prayed to receive Jesus Christ in front of that little shack in that section of the Dominican Republic, which is now populated by Haitians who are illegal immigrants and who are hated by Dominicans. <laughs> but there they are. She fell to her knees and she prayed. And I said something to her that she didn't understand and that the interpreter didn't understand when he translated what I said to her in Creole. I said, Dorothy, you're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I'm funny like that. You hang around with me long enough, you'll have my sense of humor. <laughs> she just looked at me kind of funny, and so did he. Our translator's name was Jefferson. First day, my, day I called him Thomas Jefferson. And the second day I said, today you're George Jefferson because we're moving on up. <laughs> if you don't help me, I'm going to stop here in just a minute. <laughs> but Dorothy came to know Jesus that day. 
It was quite a battle for her soul, as Jeremy said. She honestly said, I love the pleasures of this world too much to come to God. But you know what? Six total strangers from America said to her, peace, peace. Jesus can bring you something. The world can't bring you peace. She heard it, and it went into her heart. And she decided the peace of God was more important than the pleasures of the world. And now she has peace with God. What was really great about that visit was the first lady had confessed not going to church in a long, long time. And the last thing I did, everybody else was going down the road, I hung behind, and I took the first lady, her name was Vielle, like Violet, in French, in Creole, Vielle, and I brought her to Dorothy, and I told Vielle through the translator, Jefferson, he was Thomas that day, <laughs> I said, Jefferson, tell Vielle, now she has to go to church because she has to take Dorothy, and she has to disciple Dorothy. They have to go together. They're friends. They lived in the adjoining shacks. And when he communicated that to them, they had one of those eyeball conversations. You know, you look at each other, but you don't say anything. And it was like both of their faces lit up, and they understood. They both had to walk with God together. Wonderful thing. Wonderful thing that we experienced down there. Every time we decide to be a peacemaker, there's a possibility we'll face some form of a persecution. But we experience what Jesus did. We experience his sufferings. We experience his burden. We experience his heartache and heartbreak for people who are at war with God and at war with each other. We feel what he felt. And it's not just about being a Christian or an American Christian or a Baptist or a Southern Baptist or a church member. It's about being a child of God and knowing that people need Jesus Christ. And we feel that and we cry out, God, what am I going to do? How can I reach these people? How can I communicate with them? How can I show them? And what if they hate me? And what if they reject me? And what it? And we experience the deepest blessing that a child of God can experience. And that's the blessing of Jesus' heart. Blessings in disguise. And then we were at the lady's house that Jeremy was telling you about. I don't know any way to describe this to you, but I'm going to try. A total stranger, a man across the street, hollered at us and led us to this house. And the people welcomed us into the house. The house had three rooms. The front room was probably as big as your bathroom. The kitchen was probably half the size of your bathroom. And the bedroom was big enough for the bed to be stuck in two corners and just barely room to get around to the foot of the bed. The only three rooms in the house. And they led me into this back bedroom where a woman lay dying. I've had a lot of experience with death in my life. And I knew the time was short. I took Karen with me, a young lady, um, because I knew there would be women in the room. And so I wanted a woman in there with me. And there were four women around the bed. I don't know if they were daughters, if they were sisters. These were Dominicans, not Haitians, by the way. And... Um, I told them who I was in my broken Spanish, which is usually good enough to communicate with people. And they were so thankful that a pastor was there. If I'd have been a Catholic priest, and some of you have Catholic backgrounds, I would have performed the last rites for this woman. And uh, we prayed as she died. She went somewhere. I don't know if she went to heaven or not. But think of the odds of being an American pastor in Pinckneyville, Illinois, and getting on a plane and flying to the Dominican Republic, taking a bus two hours into an area, walking for hours through homes, and winding up in the room of a dying woman, 
trying to share peace in the troublingest of times. Quite an experience. Holy ground. Sacred times. Things that are hard to talk about. Things that are hard to make sense of. And yet things that we are supposed to be part of. As we make peace. And face whatever we face in our pursuit of blessings in disguise. And I said to them, Cielo, Cielo, heaven, heaven is coming. As they sobbed, the tears came down as I tried to do all I could to help these people to grow with their grief and find hope in the groping. And then I went to hug, stroke their hair. And yes, the big red hanky came out. Their noses, their tears. And we hugged and we cried. And the peace of God was there. Blessings in disguise. We don't see them. We're too busy. We're too selfish. We're too focused on our own thing. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want to stand around the deathbed. We don't want to hold people's hands and wipe people's noses. And yet there are blessings in disguise for the peacemakers who will face the persecution of the world and sometimes of their own church in order to be faithful to God's calling to reach people wherever they are, whoever they are, in whatever way we can. That's what Jesus did. That's why you're here. That's why we're going to heaven. Because he went to the cross And it looked like the most tragic thing that ever happened on the earth. And yet at the cross, he paid for our sins. He wore the crown of the prince of peace. And that's what we remember when we come to this table this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and let's pray. And let's invite the presence of the Lord here this morning. Maybe you're hurting today. Maybe you're struggling today. Maybe you're looking for the hope today. Don't miss the blessings in disguise. Don't miss what God is doing around you. Don't be blinded by your pain. Don't be numb by your need. Yes, it's real. Yes, it's true. And yet there's a blessing. There are blessings in disguise. As the Prince of Peace gathers around you, your situation, your circumstance, your marriage, your family, your situation, He's here to touch you, to hold you, to comfort you, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Prince of Peace. And as we come to the table, we remember what he's done for us, what he's doing for us, and what he's going to do. We remember the blessings, and we rejoice in him. Are you burdened this morning? Are you hurting this morning? Do you have a need this morning? He's here. He's here for you. He loves you that much. Talk to him about it. Tell him about it in a still whisper and a prayer. 
turn to him this morning. Let the peace come. Trust in him this morning. Let the peace come. Let the Lord Jesus into your life this morning. Let him into your heart. John's gospel, he said, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Peace is more than a feeling, like the peaceful, easy feeling of the song. It's a deep, abiding sense of his presence in your heart and in your life. And he said, no one can take that from you. That's what we all need so that we can be the peacemakers so that people can come to know the Jesus we know, the Prince of Peace. Have our guys come now and distribute the elements. We're going to worship together. When everybody's received, we'll all partake together. The splendor of a king Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And 
my heart will sing how great is our God. There were blessings in disguise. The disciples didn't really get it. Sometimes we don't either. Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. It's a blessing in disguise. You see it? His body broken for you. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. He said, the cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for the remission of sin. Doesn't sound like a blessing. It was a blessing in disguise. You see it? His blood shed for us. Then he said, this do in remembrance of me. And then he said, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death. Death doesn't sound like a blessing. It's a blessing in disguise. He said, you proclaim my death until I come. He's coming. He's coming. When? Don't know. But until then, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they who are persecuted for my name. Blessings in disguise. If you pass your cups to the center, our brothers will collect them. Please stand as they pass by. And let's join hands and have a final blessing before we go our way today. I'll be up here at the front if anybody would like to come up, need to talk about anything, pray about anything. I'll be waiting up here. Love to talk to you. Love to pray with you. Father, what a joy to be home. And what a wonderful week and experience. Every time I go somewhere, I'm glad to get back. <laughs> but I'm glad I got to go to meet people, to look into their eyes, to hear their hearts, to touch their lives in some way, to do the best I can with what you've given me, to be a peacemaker, to deal with the opposition, to deal with the enemy, to deal with those things that come against us with the only weapon we have, and that's the peace of Jesus Christ. It just be his hands and feet and heart wherever we go. So help us, Lord, as we leave here today, throughout the week, help us to be the peacemakers, to proclaim Jesus as Lord, to help people see him and to know him. Help us to do all that we can. Help us, Lord, to see those blessings in disguise so that we may praise you and worship you and glorify you in all that we do. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful afternoon.